Jesus Christ really is alive, hits us. Because if you really believe that Jesus Christ has risen, I tell you, you will understand what Jesus said. I have come to give you life and life in all its fullness. See, the pastor said last weekend that his sermon, Why Jesus Didn't Defend Himself, was a follow-up of the Easter presentation where Pastor David and Pastor Richard gave us the the, the Easter story. Well, I'm carrying on where, where Pastor left off. He said Jesus did not defend himself because Jesus wanted to let the course of events that God had so planned, the will and the purposes of God be established, that he would reveal himself as the, as the Lamb of God given to take away the sins of the earth on the cross. And today I'm going to say that because he has given his life, our lives can never be the same again. But more than because he gave his life, because he rose again, that's what makes all the difference. Because if Jesus had died, and if we were still waiting outside the tomb that was sealed, we are no different than anybody else who believes in a religion where the founder is no longer alive. But because we serve a risen Savior, Everything changes. Everything is all different. That's why for my scripture text this morning, I'm using Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Philippians 3 verse 10. I want to know Christ. And this particular word know is a very, very meaning-laden, loaded word in the New Testament. It is a word that is translated into English just as know. But really, in the original languages, it means to experience, to have a conviction, to have had an encounter with, to be absolutely convinced that I know, I know, I know, I know. I want to know Christ. I want to have the kind of a relationship with Him where I will abandon myself, just as the worship leader encouraged us to do just now, with hands lifted up, abandoned into Christ's life and to Christ, Christ's power. I want to know the power of his resurrection. That is, I want to know the hope that comes. If Jesus had defended himself and, and somehow they had let him go, the Lamb of God would not have been slain for the sins of the world and neither would we have seen the power that God demonstrated to us by raising Christ Jesus from the dead. And if he rose from the dead and if Christ could raise him from the dead, and if the Holy Spirit who raised him from the dead is the same Holy Spirit who is living in us today and who is in our midst, hey, this is a service that is more powerful than any other place you can find yourself in. Because at any moment, God's glory can explode in our midst. And I tell you, friends, if you've got hope in your heart right now, the Bible tells us hope is never disappointed in Jesus. Ever. I'm running ahead. But the cross, the cross has always been the central message of the Christian faith. In fact, when Mahatma Gandhi met some missionaries who were wanting to lead him to Jesus, Gandhi asked them, if you were just given one opportunity to sing one of the many hymns which I hear you sing, which hymn do you think really encapsulates and summarizes your entire message that you would like to share with me. And the missionaries looked at him and unanimously agreed that the one hymn would be when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. The missionaries were wanting to tell Gandhi, you know Gandhi, it is the cross, it is the cross, the empty cross that summarizes all that we believe. We have been reminded we don't worship just a person who is crucified 
and a crucifix take the center stage in our lives. We don't worship that, but we worship a risen Savior where he's no longer on the cross and he lives with us. The cross remains the key event so that we can understand God and everything that is happening in this world. God actually gave us answers to all the things that you and I are perplexed about. Sometimes there are different ones who ask me, Pastor Stephen, how come Calvary doesn't make political stands and condemn this person or speaks against that person? I say, you know, we don't do that. But do you realize how many times in our prayer, in our teaching, we teach that the government is on the shoulders of Jesus Christ and our government is subject and the governments of all the world are subject to Jesus. We are addressing issues related to politics. God rules and governs. Sometimes I say, why don't we address issues such as religious extremism and horrible acts of violence like when a four-year-old girl can go on an outing with her mother and all of a sudden a man comes and severs her head. How come we don't address issues like that? Don't we? We surely do. We talk about how life apart from God and apart from having Jesus as Lord is ruled by the kingdom of this world and Satan who is intent on destroying human life. And that the only way and the only answer to atrocities such as this is to understand that these are reminders that you and I need to go and bring the good news of the salvation of Jesus to all. Sin is real. People are captive to sin. And the only way the power of sin is broken is when that individual allows Jesus to be Lord and accepts Jesus Christ into their heart. No, we don't need another new economic plan. Well, I'm, I'm just saying this not to say that we don't need to plan, we do. What I mean is, no, it is not a new economic plan that will save Malaysia. It is not a whole new set of do this, do that that will save Malaysia. Only Jesus saves. Pray for our, land, our land that God will show up in a wonderful way. I come back to my thoughts. What if, what if Jesus never rose again? What if he just died as a good man, as a teacher? I want to take you back to the period where the disciples were living and ministering together with Jesus, and they were extremely perplexed at his behavior. There were high points and low points. All this was before the crucifixion and his resurrection, which changed their lives. The truth of the resurrection changed their perspective towards everything else that had happened. But you know, I'm going to share with you four things that people who are unclear of the resurrection or who have not yet understood that the resurrection really took place, four tensions, four issues that so often come up. You see, at the time when the crucifixion was drawing near, issues began to surface in the relationship between Jesus and the disciples. And I must say to you, sometimes I have these discussions with Jesus as the wise one, as the one who gives me instructions, and I forget that he is not just a good teacher. He's my savior who died and rose again. Far more than just somebody who is wise and has good words of comfort. So these are four areas that the disciples had to grapple with. 
And these four areas are described for us in Matthew chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17. Please go back and read those chapters for yourself. But there you find that Jesus is now beginning to have problems with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were accusing him of going against the law of Moses. There we begin to see that his popularity began to take a plunge because he was, from the eyes of the disciples, being too blunt, speaking out for righteousness and integrity. You know, speaking out for integrity has never been popular. Whether you live during the time of Jesus or whether you live now. It was a time where some of the highs included these things. Where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he asked them, who do you say I am? And among the twelve, they said, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist. And Jesus says, but who do you say I am? And Peter Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed art thou, son of Jonah. Peter, you have said something wonderful, and flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. My father in heaven did. And upon your confession that Jesus Christ is the Lord, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, my church will be founded. My church will be built. And Peter, I tell you, floated on air and I... If I could, like I've said in the past, in my mind's eye, I just see Peter doing this. Jesus said that his smile gets broader and broader, and he looks across at John and says, see, see? And he looks across at the other side and says, hey, Andrew, see or not? See? So proud. And in a few days' time, Jesus begins to talk about going to the cross and dying on the cross, that it must be fulfilled. And Peter says, no, that cannot be. You cannot die on the cross. And then Jesus looks at him straight in the eye and says, get thee behind me, Satan. And do you think Peter looked at Andrew and looked at John this time and said, see, see? I think Peter probably wanted a hole to open up in front of him and just swallow him. I'm focusing on this man, Peter that before Jesus went to the cross, died and resurrected, he went through every manner of questioning that you and I also get involved and get engaged in. Here are the four things that I believe Peter struggled with. As he heard Jesus confronting the Pharisees and the Pharisees answering Jesus and the tone of Jesus' teaching becomes more and more serious, in the beginning, it was nice. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Everybody wanted to come to Jesus. When Jesus healed the sick, cast out demons, when he was talking to little children, everybody loved him. And everybody wanted to be close to him. And the disciples had a very special privileged position. And it was something that Peter treasured. He had a special significance in the community because don't you know, the guy is right-hand man of Jesus, you, you know. But friends, just as it happens now, it happened then. In some of our weirder, wilder times, have you ever thought, hey, I wish I wasn't a Christian. If I wasn't a Christian, I can do this, I can do that. It won't matter. Hey, yeah. The way I would approach my job, the way I approach my employers, the way I approach my employees would be... S I mean, and all of a sudden, Peter found it difficult. Because Jesus called black, black, white, white, sin, sin. And many people were upset because Jesus was so direct in the manner in which he rebuked sin. Don't water down truth. In our 
our lifestyles when we are confronted like Peter. Don't water down truth. But you know, Peter did not have the gift of hindsight that you and I have. At this point of time to him, even though he had confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, he was thinking that Jesus was the Old Testament Messiah. He had not yet seen Jesus die on the cross and resurrect. So even to Peter, it seemed as though Jesus was making himself unpopular by saying those things he did. And that's why he wanted to temper Jesus and said, Jesus, don't talk like that. Nah. We'll come back to Peter later after Jesus died and crucified. It was more a liability than an asset to be a Christian to Peter at that point of time. John 6, 66 to 67. Interesting, huh? John 666, you cannot forget that. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you not want to go away also? Do you? And of course, the answer Peter gives at that point of time is, Where do we go to? You are the one who has given us eternal life. The second thing that they had to decide to do, Peter had to decide to do was, should we trust Jesus or not? Because what he's doing now seems so different. Because we expected the Old Testament Messiah to come and re-establish the kingdom of Israel. We expect him to lead us in a revolt against the government of Rome and to re-establish the glorious kingdom where God himself rules. And here he is going around telling us, forgive those who do badly against us or who hurt us. Bless and do not curse. When someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. And Peter was just flabbergasted. Can we trust him or not? Can we trust him or not? The disciples became troubled as he, be as he began to speak of his impending death. Surely this was not the glorious Messiah that they were looking for. Not the glorious Messiah the Old Testament talked about. So two issues. One had to do with, it seems to be inconvenient being a Christian because people didn't like you. Secondly, there was a trust issue here. Can I trust him or not? The third thing that, that Peter had to do was this concept of commitment that Jesus called for. Jesus talked about sacrifice versus comfort and convenience. When they first met him, they heard him say this, but they didn't seem to take this to heart. Where Jesus said, let foxes of holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Talking about how, hey, don't talk about you. Earthly, uh, earthly comforts because there's something greater to be done. And besides, God always prepares a place. That's what Jesus meant. But now he said to them in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 26, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? To us, we read this, it already sounds like it is quite a call. But to the people of Jerusalem, who were familiar with the sight of hundreds and hundreds of crucified men outside the walls of Jerusalem, because crucifixion was one of those ways of punishment that the Romans used so often, and it was something that they were familiar with. They saw thieves, they saw anybody who upset the Roman government being crucified just outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And if you walked along the, the road to Jerusalem, if you were coming into Jerusalem, you would see people hanging on crosses left to die. And Jesus said to the disciples, hey, if you want to have a great life, there might be a 
up your cross, there will be sacrifice. The disciples thought, we didn't follow you to deny ourselves. We followed you because we wanted to rule over Israel together with you. So the third issue they had was, what do I get out of this? Remember, I'm talking about how attitudes of the disciples deferred before Jesus was resurrected. They thought in terms of popularity, they thought in terms of personal gain, they thought in terms of how come you behave like that one. And the fourth, the fourth was how to confront failure. I mean, Peter put his foot where his mouth was very often. And Jesus rebuked him in public. As far as Jesus was concerned, when, when something needed to be corrected, he corrected it. And I think at that point of time, Peter must have been wondering, shall I just give up? Why follow this guy? I seem to be getting public rebuke more than anything else. I don't like correction. I don't like being told what is right and what is wrong. Ah, but after the cross, everything changed as I'm bringing this thought, this set of thoughts. No conclusion in the next 10 to 15 minutes. But the view after the cross totally changed. Peter, now a wiser disciple, having on the third day, the morning of the third day, run to the empty tomb and find it empty. And then later, being met by the risen Christ and forgiven by the risen Christ for his, his denial in the courtyards of the high priest. Peter now sees Je Jesus totally different because he lives. This is how Peter lives now. All those things that he used to think as being important. Me first. I want to be popular. How can like that one? I don't understand. All those were swept aside. And he writes this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of, Christ, of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So different. He's telling the persecuted church. Peter was writing to a church that had been born on the day of Pentecost and who was misunderstood and which was misunderstood by, the, by both the Romans and the Jews. The Jews did not like the church because they thought that they had, the church had now usurped the law of Moses and, and Jesus was, was the one who now has, oh, in, was intent on destroying Judaism. The Jews didn't like the church because the church was stealing away those who used to follow the law of Moses. The Romans didn't like the church because the church, they thought, was a political power. And besides, the church did strange things. But Peter, in the midst of criticism from his fellow Jews and living in danger from the Roman authorities, speaks with such clarity and wisdom because Christ lives, because he rose again. Remember this. Remember we now have a living hope because we serve a living Christ. Isn't that wonderful? You and I have a living hope because we have a living Christ. If Christ was dead and he had just promised us many promises, there was no seal to say these things would come true. That's why in Jesus Christ, Paul says, every promise is yea and amen. 
because he lives today. Today, the promises that he made to you and to us as a church, they are yea and amen. Number two, he says you will get an inheritance that is imperishable, that will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. You know what this is? It is his presence in our lives. The greatest inheritance that he's given to us is himself. That's why he talks about how earthly treasures can pass away. Moth can come. Rust can destroy. But the treasure in heaven is Jesus himself, our relationship with him. When we have him, everything else is ours. There is no lack to those who have Jesus as their Lord, their Savior, their protector, their provider. And Peter says, hey, because he is risen, because he is risen, it doesn't matter about Jewish authorities, it doesn't matter about Roman authorities. My relationship with him is paramount. But besides having this living hope where the promises of God come true for us, besides having Jesus himself as our inheritance, Paul talks about how we are always protected by the power of God. You know, God has a will and a plan and a purpose for every single one of us, and this will never be thwarted. He has a plan and a purpose and a will for Calvary Church, and it will never be thwarted because he lives. So regardless of what you hear or read on social media or what you choose to focus your thoughts on, there is a God in heaven who reigns over all and rules over all and who has the very last word. How then should we live? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, he says this, And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice greatly with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Trust and worship him, won't you? Because he lives. Peter says to these people who have now come to know Jesus and who in the past had not seen Jesus but now have heard of his resurrection. Peter says, you, you didn't see him personally, but I stand and I vouch that he lives. And by the way, the Bible is a testimony that he lives and there are extra biblical sources that tell us he lives. And because he lives, says, Paul, says Peter, rejoice, trust him, worship him. Number two, Peter says, trust his word. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 8 says this, Coming to him as a living stone which has been rejected by man, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And the reason why he says this is because of, of Scripture. For this is contained in the Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve. The stone which the builders rejected, this has become the very cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. What Peter is saying, it's just this. Jesus' death and resurrection proves to us that God's word is true. Thirdly, don't just keep this news to yourself. Tell others of his love. First Peter 3, 15 and 16. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. Paul says, set apart Jesus Christ as Lord in your heart. Know him. Have a story to tell about him. Have a story of your conversion. Have a story of a recent experience with him. Tell people what happened when you trusted him. Be always ready with a story, with a reason 
for your continued walk and your continued faith in Jesus. And as you tell people of different faiths and different, different uh, people from different levels of society, do this with gentleness and respect. Because he lives, we cannot keep the hope that we have to ourselves. Because he lives, we cannot keep the relationship that we have with him to ourselves. Because he lives, his power needs to be told to your loved ones that he has power over death, over disease, over sin. We cannot keep it to ourselves. A couple of weeks' time right here in this auditorium, you are going to be given another opportunity to share. We're going to have evangelist Nathan Morris from the UK, together with all the other Assemblies of God churches. We're going to hold evangelistic meetings, healing evangelistic meetings. I know some of us went to the MCA hall last year when he was here, and we saw that the entire hall was packed out. All the overflows were packed out. And I both saw and heard those who were sick being healed, those who were afflicted with different kinds of spiritual afflictions being set free, that will take place here. Because he lives, anything is possible for his glory. And today, as I just read one passage from Paul, and in a few minutes, as we respond to the Lord and then seal all this by taking communion, I ask you to think of where you are today. I hope you're not living as someone who doesn't think Jesus has been raised, uh, as, as someone who doesn't believe or who hasn't experienced the resurrected life. I hope you're not like Peter and the gang who were so confused before the resurrection. But I pray you're like Peter after the resurrection, that you're proud to be a Christian. You're proud to stand for the truth. You're proud to say that you know God has a will and a plan, even though sometimes you don't know what's going to happen yet. Let's read this last scripture before the worship team comes out and helps us. Last scripture I want to look at is from the writings of Paul to, to Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the cleverer I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this earth? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of, the, of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased to the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, the Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block to the Gentiles' foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, and Calvary Church, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And in conclusion, just remember these three thoughts. The cross reveals the extravagant love of God. As you sit here today, know that. He doesn't condone our weaknesses. He loves us in spite of our weaknesses. He doesn't reject us because of our failures, but wants us to come to Him that He may lift us up out of the situations we've gotten ourselves in. His love is an active, transforming love. He goes far beyond just comforting. He speaks of transformation and hope. The cross reveals the wisdom of God because to the Jews and the Greeks, the cross was foolishness, stupidity. Why should you believe in someone who died like a thief on a cross? But 
God so exalted him as a result of his humility that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The cross reveals the wisdom of God. Are you perplexed over something that is happening to you right now? Jesus is risen. God has a plan. And the cross reveals the awesome power of God. Is there anything that God cannot do for us today? I'm not saying this to make us self-centered. I'm telling you this is the resurrected life. Those who live believing that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead are people who know that God loves them and they will determine to love God back in every area of their lives and to come to God for every need. Those who believe in the resurrected Christ will not be in despair when there's a lack of understanding and clarity in situations around them. And those who believe in the resurrected Christ believe that with God, all things are possible. And as we are often reminded from here, Jesus never fails. That's the resurrected Christ. Will you bow your heads with me at this time? So come towards the end of the service. When Pastor Fis gave me this privilege, I prayed, and immediately these three words came to my mind. To be honest with you, I wasn't very keen on preaching this because Easter is just over and we've been hearing so much about it. But I felt the Holy Spirit kept saying to me, Stephen, ponder, because he lives, Stephen, remind the congregation because many of us today treat the resurrection as history, as story, but we don't appropriate it for our daily living. We serve and worship a resurrected Christ. You may be here today and you're saying, Pastor Stephen, you know you began by talking about the need to know Jesus better. I want to be honest with you, Pastor Stephen. I come to service and all too often I'm distracted. And sometimes I have to confess because I'm so tired from work during the entire week. I don't, I don't really catch everything that is said. But Pastor Stephen, I have this desire that each time I come to service, I will know God more. Will you pray for me? I want to know Jesus more. I want to, I want to be able to, to speak of Him. And I want to enjoy a relationship with Him. I don't want to, to, to say that I know He exists somewhere far away. I want to sense Him and have this immediacy of His presence in my life. Will you pray for me? Of course we will pray for you. But the Bible always talks about how there's a great need for us to put our trust whenever we seek God for something. And the way to put your trust this morning is to just indicate by an uplifted hand say, Pastor Stephen, pray for me. I want to know Jesus better. I want to know the risen Christ better. We just put up your hand and put it down all over the sanctuary. Thank you. I see hands lifted all over, down and up. How many of you are here today and you have a great need for saying to the Lord, Lord, I have a need for healing. I have a need, Father, for wisdom. I have a need, Father, for the Holy Spirit's strength to help me through a situation that I don't understand. I'm fearful of going to the office tomorrow. I'm fearful because I have heard of a friend or a relative's sickness. But today, because I've heard that Jesus lives, I want to trust in Him personally. Would you stand together with me as we sing this beautiful chorus, Because He Lives? I've chosen this because we all know this chorus and there's no need to look at the screen. If the Lord has spoken to you and you're saying, I want to know Him better, or you're saying, I want a touch from the resurrected Lord, 
And for some of you, especially since it's communion today, you know you've not been living right. And you have been thinking to yourself that I need the strength to make good decisions. And you've been tempted to compromise your integrity, your business dealings, and your marital relationships. In various areas in your life, and you're coming to the Lord and saying, God, I'm sorry. God, cleanse me. As we sing this song, don't wait for it to finish. Wherever you are, just come by. Seek Him. Seek Him for greater relationship. Seek Him for an answer to prayer. Seek Him for forgiveness for something that He has done wrong. The risen Christ is in our midst. Father, even as we stand in Your presence this morning, knowing that Your Word never changes, Just as you are, so is your word. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it is on the authority of your word that we stand believing that we can know you and know the power of your resurrection through experiences that you allow us to go through in life. To know, Lord, that what seems to be a dead situation, that which seems to be an impossible situation, you're able, Lord, to help us experience the power of God, that you are God and there's none like you. And today, as these stand around these altars, looking to you, Father, to know you, to know the power of your resurrection, to understand what it is to have fellowship with your sufferings that only causes us to be a people purified, a people cleansed by experiences that you bring us through that we may become more and more like you. Somebody say amen. For our suffering is not a suffering, Lord, that destroys. Our suffering, Lord, is not a suffering that doesn't produce value and credit. And we thank you, Father, that as some who are facing such situations, help them to realize, Lord, that there comes a purification, Lord. There comes, Lord, a transformation as we go through experiences that we don't seem to understand. But this morning, I pray your word, your word will strengthen us, Lord, in each situation. Cause us to know that you died and you rose, that we may have hope. Somebody say amen. amen. You died and you rose, Lord, that we can have life eternal, to the glory of God. And so I ask your blessing, Heavenly Father. I ask that you would touch each individual standing here. And those, Lord, who are looking to you this morning as they open your heart, their hearts to you and to the preaching and teaching of your word, receive and may they be blessed in a very special way. Yes, Father, I pray for healing of sick bodies today, Lord. Father, I pray that you would touch them and make them whole. And know, Lord, that you're a God that says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. I ask your blessing. I ask for your cleansing. And if there's some here today, Lord, that's going through a situation that they, they realize, Lord, that they have failed or they have disappointed you or they've done something, Lord, that they realize it has brought shame and regret to you. Cleanse them, Father. Forgive them, Father, as they put their faith and confess their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I ask for your blessing and for the grace of God and for the love of God to be their portion in Jesus' wonderful name.